I was once told that to become who you might be, you have to walk away from what you are. That maybe I couldn't see it at the time, but somewhere locked away in the depths of my soul existed the spark, the flicker of light that would change everything. All I had to do was find it. Those footsteps, they define your destiny. A symphony that becomes your soundtrack, wind for your sails. They are the song that will guide your journey. In your pockets, they can be empty if your heart is full. The book can be unwritten if you hold the pen. The path can be unclear if you just trust yourself. This is the lens that illuminates your world. And when you fall, promise to get back up. When you feel misplaced, Remember that getting lost is how you find yourself. When you're scared, know that it's darkest before the dawn. These are the stairs that will take you higher. Tired is not defeated. Wandering is not lost. Vulnerability is not weakness. Mistakes are not defining. Hardship is not a deterrent. These are pages in the story you're writing. And it's the story of a lifetime. So pull back the curtains. Dance in the moonlight, sing at the top of your lungs so that every soul from here to infinity ignites. Life is too short to miss a moment, too beautiful to overlook, and here you are with a map, a key, and a horizon waving you on. So follow it. Through the airwaves, past the mountains, beyond the desert, follow it until your legs are weak and your eyes wide. Let it be the song that carries you home. This is the story of a lifetime. Everything around you has a story. In fact, many stories. And more importantly, our lives are the culmination of these stories. See, we don't identify things through an objective lens. We see them in relation to our individual beliefs, our needs. Strange as it sounds, our lives are almost entirely fiction. They're arbitrary. When was the last time you got into your car and thought of it as nothing more than metal in part? Probably not recently, right? We see it as a gateway to where we need to be. Mobility, freedom. Just like art isn't brush strokes or sonic vibration, it's an emotive escape. We give meaning to things and those meanings vary. The world as it exists through our eyes is entirely subjective. You ever wonder how something can be a problem to one person and a solution to someone else? Or how deeply held political beliefs can be so contradictory? 
How can a movie come out and half its critics say it's amazing, the other half say it's eh, subpar? Right? Life is subjective. It's an infinite amount of tiny stories that come together to create our world, and everyone that you walk by has their own. And here's why that's worth discussing. Here's why it matters, because we fall into the trap of using these make-believe guidelines. After all, that's what they are to define ourselves. And we deem other people's uh, subjective norms as truth, the benchmarks for our own pursuits. Consensus is good, well then it must be good. They say it's bad, well then it must be bad. From the perspective of a creator, one of my most important realizations was that you know, feedback of something I've created or a lack thereof doesn't define the value of the work. You know, I still think some of my best work is essentially undiscovered. Some of the things I've thrown together in 10 minutes uh, have been seen by millions of people, and that doesn't change how I value the work with little recognition. That's just our emotions drawing false conclusions. Here's a different example. Let's say there's a, a baker, right? And he's got a bakery in a neighborhood and does great work, right? His shop's been open for a decade. He's been in business. But one day, Oprah walks in, takes a bite, loves it, recommends it. Suddenly, his cake is everywhere. Suddenly, they're extraordinary. Same question, right? What changes about the cake? Nothing. What changes about the baker? Nothing. Excellence lived there the entire time. Did his work become more the second it got a powerful endorsement? No, it was simply recognized. And this understanding, the reason I'm bringing these examples up is because knowing that is crucial to whatever it is you're trying to build or become in your life. Because these narratives matter. The good, the bad, the ugly, they don't stop coming at you. They don't stop peeking around the corner trying to influence your story. And just because you're not where you want to be yet, just because you haven't seen the external reward, it does not mean you aren't brilliant. It doesn't mean you're not on track towards excellence or you're changing the world. Maybe you are that baker before Oprah skips on into the shop. I don't be someone who confuses everyone else's story with reality. That makes it incredibly difficult to take control. A lot of people we call brilliant now, they weren't thought highly of along the way. In some cases, quite the opposite. And thankfully, they understood the subjectivity of their brilliance. That if you're confident in your voice and your message, if you sacrifice and dive into expertise in an area, the value rises to the surface. Society will adapt and conform to you simply because you didn't bow down to it. There's brilliance there. It just needs to be believed in and refined. Even when others don't get it. Even when it's abnormal. Even when your passion receives no validation. See, brilliance manifests itself brick by brick. And it's very easy for passersby to laugh at that unfinished frame of the house. But eventually, it comes together. And the layout is beautiful. And the architecture is stunning. And your defiance carves a little niche for itself somewhere in the depths of reality. Then the light bulb goes off. Then it's understood. Maybe you were right all along. There's a saying that just because you spent a long time making a mistake doesn't mean you need to continue making it. There's an incredible advantage in life for those who can separate past and future, who can recognize sunk costs and walk away, walk away from the past, move on to new things. But here's the challenge, right? Like so many things, our instinct is to preserve. It's, yeah, but I've invested so many years. I've spent X amount of dollars and maybe I don't like where I'm at, but look how long it's taken me to get here. 
Well, here's the reality, that time is gone. That money is not coming back no matter what you do or what direction you take from here on out. There's no reason to think you have to maintain the same trajectory or hold on to a specific identity or pattern of behavior. Yesterday isn't the focal point here. The goal is simpler. What matters now and how will you get there now? You've grown, you've evolved, you've changed and your targets have shifted. So why shouldn't you? The idea of sunk costs is so important because it's essentially realizing that you're not indebted to the resources you've spent or exhausted. There's no need to be a slave to previous decisions that you've made. No, just chalk it up as an integral step in your learning process, an aspect of growth, and move forward to what matters, to what you care about. And if that seems obvious, I challenge you to think about the decisions you've made over the last year, and I guarantee you, you've let factors affect your decision-making that are irrelevant to your goals. Because we feel this camaraderie with yesterday, like there's a debt to be paid, but man, life is too short to run in place. If it's not pushing you forward, drop it. If it's not what you need, forget it. In other words, don't be one of those people that wakes up and makes the same mistake every single day because you've spent a long time making it. See, reality only exists in your head, and that's why it's beautiful. You can unlock the cell door and walk out. Don't lose sight of the greatest gift you have. The new beginning that lives in every second where you can take a turn you've never taken before, remove the mask and play a role you've never played. Let that sense of excitement pull you to new things. Let go of what you can't change and pursue what you can. Forget the time spent. Think of now. Where can you invest now? Your surroundings didn't magically arrive. You chose them and you can just as easily take that wheel and leave. Simple formula. What is best for you and how do you get there? Not where you feel obligated to be or expected to be or pressured to be. Where do you need to be? Everything else is noise. Everything else is a rope keeping your ship on shore and you are not confined to that harbor or yesterday's destination. You're built to chase the horizon, follow your curiosity into the sunset. You don't make decisions based on yesterday's story. You sculpt it with tomorrow's possibility. Sometime last winter, I got an email from someone asking if I'd help them with a keynote speech they were delivering. I'd never met this person before. His name was Rod, seemed like an awesome dude. Uh, said, absolutely. So we arranged a date, he flew into South Florida, and we met to chat about the project. Now, a lot of time has passed you know, since then, and the reason I'm bringing it up now is really twofold. Um, the first, and probably the most important is that I walked out of that meeting a different person than when I walked in. And I want to share my lesson learned because I know there are people out there that will help in a similar situation, maybe without even knowing it. And the second is, it's a perfect example of those emergent properties that uh, seem to evolve out of life after you know, days, months, years of compounded hard work that I talked about in last week's video. So back to the story, we're sitting there and he's telling me a little bit about himself. Uh, he started multiple multi-million dollar companies, produced major motion pictures. Incredible dude, done incredible stuff. He sort of makes his way to the speech, which is why he was there. Talks a little bit about his vision, what he's written, where he could use my help. And, you know, 
eventually asked Eddie, what's it going to cost me? And I didn't care, right? I just wanted to learn from the guy. I mean, he's done some amazing stuff. Uh, and just being around interesting, motivated people, you know, the more friends you have like that that inspire you to push the bar, the better. And I remember I just sort of threw out a number, a low number. And he looked at me and uh, <laughs> he, I'll never forget it. He goes, Eddie, come on, man, be a fucking salesman. And uh, I pulled out a check, wrote it for like five times more than I've, I, I usually charge for something like that. Um, and goes, from now on, you're never worth less than this number. And, and I drove away a completely different person than when I pulled it. I mean, Rod essentially uh, shined a spotlight on the fact that I was capping myself, that I was creating walls around my potential, but not just economically, in a lot of different areas of life. It reminded me that we set our own value, we decide our worth, and it's very easy to undersell ourselves. The value you depict, the value you portray, well, that becomes your reality. Right? And I've been sort of in the weeds, in the micro level, uh, you know, I, I've always felt like I could take on X, Y, Z, like throw it at me, I'll, I'll figure it out, I'll make it happen. But how easy do we forget, looking in the mirror, that we have to define the person looking back. We have to believe ourselves to be better, more, bigger. That's not a subconscious thing. You have to make time for that. I'm not just a writer, producer, filmmaker. No, I'm one of the best writer, producers, filmmakers. That is how you have to look at the world. Things aren't bigger because we don't up the ante. We're not richer, bigger, faster, more accomplished because we still see ourselves a certain way. And guess what? That doesn't change until your perspective does. And I wanted to share that because that doesn't happen every day. Right? People don't just come along, tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you're worth more than you're acting like you are. You know, I'm incredibly fortunate to have that experience and maybe you're at that point where you need that little. How are you defining your worth? How do you see yourself? Because once you begin to look uh, at yourself as one of the best the world conforms, and it's a pretty amazing thing. You start doing better work, you radiate confidence, you realize that there's a stupid amount of money out there, and the reason you don't have more of it is because of yourself and your perspective. You grow faster, you surround yourself with more people like you, and all of that comes from believing it. So ask yourself that question, in what areas of your life are you capping yourself off? Now the second piece is around putting yourself in a situation where these little realizations emerge. In the book, Ego is the Enemy, Ryan Holiday says, confidence is earned. Day in and day out, moving forward even when things suck, moving through the lows, and as time progresses, this plays hand in hand with that self-confidence that I was just talking about. Because suddenly you have the experience, you have the talent, you have the track record to back it up. And as time compounds, you're left with incredible results. Right? In last week's video, I talk about human consciousness. It's an emergent property. There's no part of the brain that specifically controls human consciousness or at least it's undiscovered at this point. All we know is that when all those pieces up there come together, consciousness somehow emerges. It's an incredible thing, provides opportunity, changes the way we see the world, sets us apart from every other living organism. Can't break it down, but it exists. And I believe that life is very similar. Working hard every day, taking those tiny steps, not giving up, driving towards some invisible destination. All those little things come together and put you in position. They open the door for opportunities that will emerge down the road. They set up the people that will come into your life, the things, the opportunities that await. A lot of ways you can't plan for them, but you're building a platform that enables success. Those little pieces come together and create something bigger than the sum of their parts, something that wasn't there originally. You can't succeed with only the vision. You can't succeed by blindly taking action. These two things work together and open doors. So believe that you're great, that you're worthy of nothing but the best. Have the framework, have the plan, and then go out every day and build it. 
rain or shine, little by little, build it. And you'll be amazed at the amount of power and control you have over your own destiny. Vision and execution are a beautiful combination and will take you to some amazing places. On the surface, it was only one. Essentially worthless. One strand of DNA. One word in a sentence. One ant in a colony. A trivial existence. One would look on and wonder, where is the value here? But like many things in life, the answer is complex. Because sure, one strand of DNA, it doesn't do anything. But many together, well, they bring about life. And one word can't tell a story, but many words create language and poetry. And one ant is defenseless, but a colony can swarm an enemy, create complex structures and living bridges. See, some things are more than the sum of their parts. And as numbers grow, capabilities expand, emergent properties manifest. Properties that didn't previously exist. They couldn't be seen when the individual pieces were examined. And your differentiator is the ability to look around you and understand that the extraordinary is always broken down into these little ordinary pieces. The same little ordinary pieces that are built back up to become the extraordinary. One attempt, one trip, one try, one shot, sure they don't mean much, but they are not powerless. Because each repetition is like collecting a strand of DNA, creating a new element of life. And it's not luck in the air or ghosts in the machine, it's using the simple to create the complex. And from the complex becomes your answer. From many nothings comes your something. So don't fixate on what the singularities fail to provide. It's not about your one shot. Look at what is created when those singularities, those actions are multiplied. When attempt after attempt pile up, new characteristics are born. A world is created. It is like the state of consciousness that exists in your mind. You can't point to it, you can't locate it, but it is a power and a brilliance that exists because of many pieces at work. So don't be fooled into thinking your final destination doesn't exist because you can't see it. It's not reliant on shot one or attempt two or take 50. It's the product of everything. Many hours, extraordinary effort, collecting little pieces that allow the complex art to materialize. From the gray matter comes the consciousness. From the abyss comes the universe. Your answers are emergent. So put your head down and collect them. When you are tired, collect. When you are unsure, intimidated, scared, collect. When you feel like the mountain has become too big to climb, collect. When you fail, collect. When you win, collect. Until those emergent properties you need are resting in the palm of your hand, collect. Your day, it will come. In your lifetime, there will be answers that no one really knows but you. So remember that, because the world will make every attempt to define truth. And the last thing you want is the shape you take to be a product of their stories passing through. They don't want white, they want blue. They don't want shade, only crystal clear views. But little cloud, that's not you. In fact, you're above all that. And the moment you turn away from who you were meant to be, well, that's the very moment you're indistinguishable from life underneath. Look, I don't mean to scare you, 
but I'm being sincere. You can't fly to the sun if you're held down by fear. And that pressure, it builds up. It precipitates tears. You can always recover when life blows you off course, but don't leave life undiscovered year after year. See, whether you realize it or not, little cloud, you're on top of the world. So know that you are. I mean, look, you fly around with the sun, moon, and stars. You take a simple blue canvas and convert it to art. If you think that's nothing, little cloud, I don't know where to start. See, life is better every day because you're here. Without you, there'd be no ocean or boats and captains to steer, no sunrise collages to watch and revere. You turn rays of light to pink and teal chandeliers. If you think that's nothing, little cloud, I beg of you, let the logic reappear because there is no limitation to what you can be. So keep your eyes on that spot where the sky meets the sea. That little cloud is where life truly begins. And little by little, you'll start to believe. So I'm going to share a life lesson with you. Something that over the years has been a true game changer. Ready? It's simple. It's very simple. Like most things, it's easy to understand. It's easy to comprehend. It's the implementation that's the challenge, right? Uh, but it's the idea that progress is not always a visible step forward. Growth is not always a measurable inch or mile, you know, to feel good about, to celebrate. It's not always a tangible victory or pat on the back uh, to smile about. Sometimes it's sidestepping. Sometimes it's stepping backwards, reminding ourselves to look up and gain perspective. Because we are always inclined to look at the immediate. That's what feels good. And this lesson says, no, there's a big picture to keep in mind. It reels us in. The big picture is what gives us purpose. It drives our happiness. That thing we want on the top of the hill, the North Star, the X on the map, that's what's sustainable. And I say it's been a game changer for me because, you know, one of my biggest adversaries over the years has been that voice in my head, almost pleading with me to indulge in the thing that will bring that immediate result. It's money now, growth now, validation now. There's comfort there. Our minds want that satisfaction. That's why you see all those guys standing next to whiteboards saying they have the formula to make you rich tomorrow. We want tomorrow. We believe in some capacity that that can be real tomorrow. But that's what tends to lead us astray. And so I've spent a lot of time reflecting over the years on how to incentivize those steps that aren't immediately impactful. There's not the flashy metal you're going to get right now, but I know that if I do it, it's going to bring me to my long-term goal. How do I incentivize that? Because like I said, the natural inclination is to dismiss it. I'm walking laterally across the mountain so that ultimately I can find the most applicable path and ascend. And that's a scary thing. You know, building long-term gives you uh, very little to immediately slap on a resume, to brag or rant about at holiday parties. There's nothing flashy to impress with, but it's believing in a long-term game, doing what most people can't, trading that certainty that you could have had for an extraordinary later. It's never a loss to do what has to be done so that you can position yourself for the future. Sometimes you have to wade through the muck, work quietly in the dark so that you can build something that you feel will have an impact. It's not a loss to step backwards to tweak the things you're not happy with. It's not a loss to explore or question or reinvent. It's true, those actions in and of themselves aren't going to put money immediately in your pockets. But if you find the discipline to see the big picture, you, know, you realize that long-term, those things bring happiness, contentment, excitement, which, guess what? Leads to accomplishment and progress and the financial stability that, that you're looking for. Chasing flashy things, chasing the immediate moment, yeah, it gets you a quick rush, a nice blast of dopamine, but it's empty. Ultimately, it's unfulfilling. 
because nothing worth having is quick. That's life. But it's often the illusion that guides us, right? You'll never see how many auditions the 33-year-old actor went through before he was cast in a major film. You don't see that. You don't see the countless hours and shows and midnight gigs in front of three people that the rock star endured. You just don't. It's not celebrated. We celebrate what we see. And what I've learned is that the most important things are just not visible to the naked eye. And it's funny. It's like people, uh, they're ashamed or embarrassed by the fact that they're climbing to the top of their own hill to something truly significant to them because the person next to them is bragging about blindly leaping three steps. Right? And that's great. Progress is great. But unless it's taking you to where you want to be most, is it a win? I have many friends that have left six-figure or higher jobs to podcast or create or start their own businesses. And people's first reaction is always like, wow, look what you have. Look what you're walking away from. We see scarcity. We are naturally inclined to see life through a lens of scarcity. You need to remember that. That's what we do. We establish and protect our well-being. That's why I've worked so hard to transform my thinking over the years. To look out and think, who cares what I had? Look what's out there. There are no limitations to what can be yours. If you're not on top of the world, make it happen. And I understand people are complex. Situations, they're not easy. They're intricate. Everyone's different. Everything is different. But there's a principle that's consistent. And it's that you can always improve your situation. That will never be false. To some degree, you can improve your situation. There's always opportunity. It's just what you see. A friend of mine sent me a text yesterday saying the past and the future, they're just imagination. All you have is now. Everything other than split second is the story you're deciding to tell yourself. That's it. Think about that. We're operating off what we decide is real or imaginary, possible or impossible. We're living in a world that is our own. There's no them or they or crowd, just individual people all telling themselves some variation of a story. And so taking this back to the point, caving into that pressure, accommodating to the now so that we feel important, so that our self-worth sees that temporary spike and neglects the opportunity. It makes us feel like we're stepping forward, that we're progressing, but in reality, are we? You know, that voice, that pressure to conform to what will impress Richard next door uh, will always lead to, it will always be to our detriment. And it takes truly what I believe is the most pure, important aspect of life and sticks it in the closet so that we can feel like we're on par with everyone else. Now, I'll never forget starting out. Um, and I bring this up a lot because it was one of those, those moments where I knew, I recognized that a huge shift was happening in my life. Um, went out with some friends from college, right? And one's working for a senator, one's a Goldman, one's a lawyer. And I'm thinking, well, you know, geez, I just quit my job. Um, but I have this really cool idea for a YouTube channel. And I just, you know, I don't think any girls are going to be swooning over that. And I struggled, right? At the time, it was difficult for me. And I'm, I'm, I look back and I'm just thankful every day that at the time I was able to locate somewhere in my soul the courage to stick that out, to believe that if I executed on this dream, I could have an impact. Because like I mentioned above, it was painful in the moment. But when you think big picture, bigger things happen. Right? I'm doing things now that I never ever would have been able to do if I didn't have that, that desire to do the unconventional thing. If I stopped at, at sort of the, the discomfort or if I stopped when I felt like I was losing this imaginary race to those people around me, I wouldn't have the creative flexibility that I have now. I wouldn't be able to do what I do now. I wouldn't have the people in my life that I have now. You have to earn that every single day. And it makes me wonder how many people stopped when they could have taken their own path, brought their own unique vision into existence if they didn't retreat when they felt like they were a lone wolf, when it felt like they were losing a race that didn't exist, when they felt like their neighbors were getting ahead or their classmates or their friends were doing the conventional things, so they had to. They were too scared to step backwards. And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you that step backwards, that ability to, to temporarily find yourself, to create yourself, that will mean everything. That will open doors for you that would never have existed. You never would have come across them because you would have been too scared to look for them. You have to make opportunities. Simple metaphor, gumball machine. Gumball does not come out if you don't put the quarter in and turn it. It's a price that has to be paid. Except in reality, the price is a lot higher than a quarter. 
because we're conditioned to want to fit in. We're terrified to look like we don't know what we're doing. Every significant thing around you stemmed from someone pushing into that unknown. It came from someone risking everything. It's not easy when your family doesn't know what you're doing, your friends don't know what you're doing, or, or you don't know what you're doing. But if you want to have an impact, that is the road you have to take. That's the cost you need, the price that you need to pay. It'll be a hard year or two years or three years, but you won't regret it. So hopefully this can be a reminder to you. When I talk about lateral steps, that's the sentiment I'm trying to recreate. You know, I think that's the great thing because it means the people who create, who build something meaningful, they've earned it. And that's what I tell myself every day, earn that dream, earn that change, right? Take that road less traveled. What you're doing right now is not insignificant simply because it's not immediately bearing fruit. I think if you listen to this back from the top, you'll, you'll notice the constant theme, immediate, now, present. These things are delusion, right? As far as results are concerned, the word immediately is a con artist. Action should be immediate, but results, no, they are gradual. They require persistence. Stick with it. Remind yourself to look up because that's what you're after. It's a pursuit. You're building a foundation. You're creating the things that permanently alter the artistic and political and social landscapes. That's remarkable. It's the road few have the patience to walk. Remind yourself why you're skipping the small stuff, brushing off the little wins and losses. And why building something substantial in silence is more powerful than gloating and screaming at the top of your lungs after every visible step. Look up, remind yourself that you are going to change the world and you can see it. Sometimes when I need to take a step back and think, I like to listen to the sound of waves on the beach, crashing in their beautiful simplicity. As quickly as they come, they go, proceeding back into that vast ocean from which they arrived. They were an instant, lightning in a bottle, this gentle reminder that all we have is right now. Sure, there's a future, but that's just a right now that hasn't arrived yet. And maybe there's a past, but isn't that just a right now come and gone? We're a collection of these singular moments in time, a product of the stars aligning, the universe conspiring to put us right here, right now. And the truth is, we can come back to the location. We can even attempt to recreate it, but it will never be what it was in that moment. Because every moment is different than the one that precedes it, and every breath takes in something new, and every glance sees just a little differently. Every second is the first, the last, and the only like waves pulsating through our veins for the very first time. Why not soak in the warmth of the sunrise? Lose yourself in the depths of worlds undiscovered. Why not chase down that spot where the road meets the horizon? Taste the sweetness in every sip. Dance under the glow of the moon. Laugh like nothing else matters. Why not cherish right now, this moment in time? So when the tide reaches down and calls for its inevitable retreat, only the magic will remain.
I was recently on a flight to Boston, and uh, the plane lands were taxing to the gate. And eventually we'd get there. The plane stops, the fastened seatbelt light goes off. And as soon as this happens, and I'm sure you know everyone's seen this, um, a large number of people on the plane jump up and they go to stand in the aisle. Where at that point they proceed to stand there for about 15 minutes depending on where they are in the plane. And I've always gotten a kick out of this, right? Everyone has their thing, this is my thing. I think it's hilarious. You watch people just standing there, they're kind of annoyed, they're cramped. Uh, you know, they're reaching over each other to grab their carry-ons and you know, find a way to stick them between their feet. It's amusing, right? Certainly not a life or death situation. There's nothing serious about it, but it is a lost 15 minutes of reading or listening to music or whatever the case may be. Uh, the moral of the story is that it's, it's a prompt decision made without much thought and you know, not much value is provided in return. And I turned to my brother who was traveling with me, made a joke. We started talking about, you know, kind of the irrationality of human beings. Why do we do things like this? Our lives are filled with things like this. And we sort of carry on like mindless drones. And then it hit me, right? I'm certainly not immune to this type of thing. And I don't think anyone is. You know, maybe I don't stand up in the plane for 20 minutes but there are certainly parallel situations. Which prompts this question, imagine if they can be recognized and weeded out. Like what are the airplane aisle moments in my life? When am I acting just to act without thinking about it or doing things that, you know, they're not helping me, but they're around. Maybe because there's this, you know, manufactured urgency I grew up with or, or I'm seeing everyone else do it. Like how many things that I do every day aren't getting me closer to where I want to be. Impulse versus what's best. And they can be small. Right? Like my impulse is to check my phone first thing in the morning. But that's probably not what's best for me. Actually, I know it's not. But I could easily see a situation where I never think about that or recognize that and just continue doing it. The world doesn't end, but I'm missing an opportunity to be a little better. My impulse is to think and worry about things I can't control. That's my impulse, but that's not what's best for me. And sure, I can see a world where I don't take time to think about that or recognize that and just, you know, mindlessly keep doing it my whole life. But I'm missing an opportunity. These things can also be big, right? Things that uh, we all do, they're commonplace. They're hidden in plain sight. Limiting yourself because of what others might think of you. We hear that so much, it almost feels like a cliche, but we do it. Right? If you've ever retracted or not done what feels right in the moment because of that inherent fear, that nervous feeling in your stomach, because you're worrying about standing out or, or being different, that is your airplane aisle decision. If you've ever made a life choice so that you can feel adequate or feel like you're keeping up with the Joneses next door, that is an airplane aisle decision. If you've ever wanted to or, or done something to bring others down, Right, so that you can stifle the competition, so that your insufficiencies feel smaller, that is an airplane aisle decision. If you've ever spoken or reacted from a standpoint of emotion, rather than taking a second to collect yourself, to stop and to think about what's best for you, that is an airplane aisle decision. And these things matter. Because if you truly thought about it, you'd know that when you're old and you're looking back on your life, the great tragedy won't be these little things, won't be these shortcuts, or, or who said what or when. No, they'll be having neglected to live authentically. Neglecting to do what's meaningful so that, why, you could uh, appease people that don't care about you? It matters because your happiness doesn't come from the Joneses. And that impulse to fit in, it derails the special gifts you bring to the world. It's cutting out your own feet from under you. It matters because there's always room at the top for anyone who works. And building people up will always come around to be more beneficial than the alternative, than trying to cut people down. When you go out of your way to do that, you don't make yourself better, which is exactly what you need to do. Make yourself better. That's what gets you results. It matters because emotional responses usually aren't the right response. And if you don't take time to think in the heat of the moment, you act irrationally. 
and you give up a tactical advantage over everyone and everything that happens around you. And my point is absolutely not to call anyone stupid or make anyone feel you know, inadequate. As I stated, we all have our thing. We all act on impulse you know, without thinking about it from time to time. There is a point in your life where you do that, whether you like to admit it or not. My point is simply that why don't we take time to think about it? They say simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Now imagine, just imagine if our lives could be streamlined to do the things that matter to us, that make us happy, that are productive, and that's it. Our lives would look a lot different. So question, question your life, question the decisions you make, question the things you do, especially if they're done every day. Almost like a business analyst walking into an organization and studying it, calling out the inefficiencies. You know, in my prior life, I dabbled in that world. And something I learned was that the, the beauty, the value of a consultant or business analyst is that they come in with fresh eyes, fresh perspective, and then smoothen the process. They get more out of the pieces that are already there. So be that in your own life. Examine, even if it's one or two things, even if it's small. Standing in an airplane aisle, this example is silly. It's small, it's not important, but who knows, removing it could reveal untapped value. It's funny, small things always seem to become big things at some point in time. And that example I gave, not looking at my phone in the morning. Uh, that can be big, right? The morning's quiet time. I'm not rushed into problems or, or focusing on things that other people put in front of me. No, I can focus on what feels right to me. It allows me to collect my thoughts, which allows me to decide how the day will go, which prompts me to conquer the things that matter, which prompts me to feel good about myself and my work which prompts me to identify as someone who wins every day. And so goes the pattern. It's just about not being blind to your actions. That's all it is. So when you're commuting or you're in between classes or you're at lunch, whenever it is, just take a second. Think about what you do and see if you can identify any of those moments. Work on them. Success is becoming who you want to be. It's defining yourself not letting the outside world, not letting your senseless actions or lack of clarity define life for you. How can I be happy all the time? It's a question I get probably more than any other, right? And every time I read that question, you know, I pause for a second and can't help but think that it's somewhat misguided, happy all the time. How can I eliminate everything? And I guess the thinking is, you know, it's, it's, it's folks that know the channel and watch uh, my videos, right? So they, they hear the perspective and the positivity and the messages and, you know, they want that to be a constant reality. And I get that. But the part that I think is overlooked is that those breakthroughs, right, those lessons learned, they come from uh, stories that were carved out from hardship, right, from some of my most difficult times. It's not that happy isn't the goal, it is. But at the macro level, it requires micro adjustments, right, periods of difficulty. You know, we're human, we have emotions, we have highs, but you bet we have lows and there's good, but there's also bad. And I don't believe that happy all the time is the target. And the target's everything that comes your way, the good and the bad, making something out of it, a net positive, finding happiness in places where perhaps we didn't see it the first time, right? Thinking big picture, thinking, macro, our overall contentment with life. See, that's the beautiful component that we're prone to overlook. And so I thought for some clarity, what I do is start from, you know, day one, when I started this journey, this entrepreneurial, um, you know, process. And I'd go through some of my messaging, some of the, the, the videos that I've released along the way and talk about why, how I got to that point, how I got to that lesson learned, and why maybe happy all the time is misleading. The first video I ever released, it's called Ode to Excellence. 
And essentially it's about, it's a promise to myself to never quit, to never give up, to never back down, no matter how difficult things get. And I wrote that uh, after my first true entrepreneurial project. I was on my own for the first time and love music, right? Music's always been sort of the backbone of my creativity. And I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put everything aside. I'd saved up some money. I'm like, I'm gonna record an album, an acoustic album. And that's what I did. And, and I blocked off the world and for three months I wrote songs and recorded them and edited them and mixed them and mastered them. Um, put them all on CDs. I sent the CDs to radio stations, clubs, bars all around Boston. I thought it was gonna, you know, be this life-changing thing. And it was, but not in the way that I thought. The CD got no traction, right? Family, friends bought it, were very supportive, but you know, that's really where it ends. And it was the first time in my life, truly, I'd given everything for something and gotten no response. It was the first time I realized that effort does not always equal a result. But here's why it was the best thing that ever happened to me. One, I realized that maybe it's not that good, which looking back now is what you'd expect doing something for the first time. It's like, dude, you have to hone your craft. You have to write 2000 songs. You have to put in so much more time to, to be at a level where you wanna be. You can't just think that it happens overnight. Right? And that was a very important thing for me to understand. The second is I realized that I was at the bottom of a very big mountain looking up. You know, this is a process. And it's gonna take persistence, it's gonna take patience. And it was stressful, right? Particularly because I didn't have that, that safety net that I once had. I wanted to retreat back to the simplicity of what I had, the sort of the, the reassurance of a job. You know, I wasn't sure that the cost, the, the uncertainty of the moment was worth it. It was stressful. But that situation helped define me, right? It wasn't perpetual happiness that taught me this lesson. No, it was one of my toughest times. From that failure came my resilience, came my ode to excellence. I wrote a speech called Perspective. And this is, you know, months down the road. Um, I, I saw my first kind of glimmer of light, right? I've been, you know, doing the music thing and, and also creating a brand on YouTube and, and sharing my thoughts, telling stories. And I finally saw a little bit of success. I wrote a speech called Running in the Rain and it was getting traction, it was doing well, it was being shared, creating buzz, I was getting speaking inquiries, all these things. And I'm like, all right, well, here we go, right? Let's go, a little bit of momentum. And I woke up one morning and I got this email from YouTube and it was like, we had to remove the video from your channel um, because you broke community guidelines. And apparently I put some keywords uh, on the bottom of the description to help it get traffic, running, inspiration, things that would help it sort of move to the top of the pile when someone searched for it. And I remember being so angry about the situation. I felt so sorry for myself. It was like momentum, attention, they're so hard to capture. I'm finally getting it and now this, right? And my views are declining and everything's going backwards. And you just feel like I was delusional. I felt like the world was ending. But that prompted me to look at the big picture, right? To realize that, look, there's nothing you can do except re-upload the video, start over, and, and, and keep my head up. Think about it. Life is going to throw things at me that are much more difficult than this, right? There's going to be difficulty and loss and uh, problem, even, even tragedy. And if I fold over a video being taken down, I don't really have a shot. Right? So from that tough time, I gained perspective. I learned to toughen up. I started to understand that it's not what happens to you because everyone has difficulty in their life, but it's how you deal with it. That's what that brings happiness at a macro level. I wrote a speech called Dancing With No Music. You know, I remember the situation exactly. I was sitting at my desk, kind of brainstorming a new project I was going to work on and my phone buzzed. I pick it up and I had a text message from uh, you know a friend at the time and he accidentally sent a text message to me kind of poking fun at, at me and my work and what I was doing 
It was meant to be about me to someone else and he accidentally sent it to me directly. Uh, and I remember sitting there thinking like, dude, are you kidding me? Like these are the people that are supposed to have your back. They're supposed to be, uh, you know, picking you up, encouraging you when you're, you know, going through these difficult times. And so in that moment, you know, I felt more alone than I, I had in a while. It wasn't a great feeling, but it prompted thought. Thought prompts perspective. And I began to realize, you know, look, it's not his fault, right? People don't see, you know, the world as it can be, right? They don't understand your vision. They see now, not your idea, not your potential. They see now. And if you want to bring that to fruition, you have to separate the negativity, separate the people that, that do that and think like that and say those things and live life like it's already there, like it's guaranteed. And so from that difficult moment, I learned that I need to dance with no music, believe in myself, see it before it's there. Act like I already hear the melody and I'm moving towards it. That's the only way to push through that cloud of chaos into the result that you want, that you so desperately want. I wrote a speech called The Last Train Home. And at this point, uh, I'd been working hard to, to build your world within for, I don't know, maybe a year at this point. One of my greatest struggles was that I continued to feel the pressure to adhere to standards that I didn't personally believe in, right? I was restricted by benchmarks that they weren't integral to my journey. And so you know, before working for myself, it was trying to impress my boss and, and you know, the idea of promotions and goal sheets. Then it became, you know, comparing my style to those around me, to people that have found success in some capacity. And I even remember, you know, running at 2 p.m. and feeling guilty because all those people doing quote unquote the right thing, they're working in an office. Like they're not, they don't have the luxury of, of running downtown. And like that was my mindset. And so I fell into the temptation of viewing uh, precedent or like previous success stories as, as not just a tool, but as the singular way to reach the summit. And so I was continually zigging and zagging, you know, here's the, here's the shortcut or here's the, the method, here's the strategy. I need to incorporate this and this and this. And every time I diverted from what felt true to me, I stumbled. Every time I left my path for someone else's, I became lost in this cloud of confusion. And it took, you know, that reoccurring experience um, for me to finally understand. You know, it was from those times of disarray that I began to see the significance of patience. That it's okay. It's okay to take my own train. Even if it's the last one to leave the station. Don't panic. Don't do something you don't feel is true or right. Believe that your train is there. It's waiting and you will catch it. That's a very difficult thing to do. It's not a happy experience, but it evolves into this freedom, right? This flexibility and ultimately this satisfaction with life that wouldn't be there uh, if you didn't seek it out, if you weren't patient enough to find it. I wrote a speech called Remember Why You Started. Hands down, one of the toughest transitions of my life. And I was in a situation that on the surface, wasn't bad. In fact, you could say it's good. I was surrounded by beautiful people, beautiful relationships, in a good place that I liked. But I was coming to the realization more and more that the situation wasn't conducive to me creating what I felt like I wanted to create. I'd sort of lost track. I've lost that fire, that energy that I had when I first began. Um, and that's due to concessions, to small compromises that I was making along the way that add up. And you sort of slowly lose yourself a little bit at a time. And when you make that realization, it's like, well, you have a decision to make. You know, are you okay 30, 40 years from now with sacrificing the thing you wanted to build because 
something else was more important or other things uh, you know, took priority. And I don't think either one is right or wrong. It's the question that you have to answer. And I made that decision. And I packed up, put my stuff in a trailer, and, and I left. And I, I remember as, you know, my world faded away in my rear view, thinking like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. I didn't believe for the first 200 miles I was actually gonna go through with it. I really didn't. And eventually, you know, I arrived at a new place and I made it my home and dedicated myself fully again to what I believed and to what I felt right, truly in my heart in doing. And I felt that energy, that fire sort of reemerge. And you know, right? You know, you wake up and it just feels good. You have this, uh, th this passion that's there um, that you want every day, that you want to maintain, that you want to drive you. And I knew, I knew it was the right decision, but that wasn't born out of happiness. That wasn't born out of the easy thing. Um, it was very, very difficult to get there. It was almost a, a, a battle, right? You have to fight to reprioritize. And so this comes up a lot when I hear that question, how can I be happy all the time? And it's like, well, you know, you can do the easy thing that's easier in the short term, but then will you be happy in the long term? You know, it's sort of a catch 22. It's a, it's a prioritization. It's understanding what makes you feel alive, what makes you feel truly good, authentic. And that's not a question of short-term, consistent, non-stop happiness. It's a question of long-term fulfillment. Sometimes we have to do the difficult things to create what we want long-term, big picture. And lastly, I'll talk about Ode to Excellence Part 3, which obviously it's been years since Part 1. And, and a lot's changed. The goalposts have shifted. The context is new, but the idea is pretty similar, right? It's, it's a promise to myself to, to move into uncharted water, whether that's because it feels right, I'm called to do it, or sometimes just for the sake of sheer curiosity. Uh, it's that idea that sometimes what awaits around the corner uh, can change your life. Right? That unknown can be exactly what you need and you don't know unless you move there. And, and the difference in context is that now I'm settled. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm substantially more comfortable than I was when this whole thing began for me. And the danger in that is nothing's screaming at you constantly to continue to grow and evolve and develop. Right? It's real easy to fall into routine and just kind of keep going the way you've always gone. And I remember sitting right outside talking to a good friend of mine on the phone and we were talking, uh, you know, strategy, talking about growing our brands and just kind of the different worlds that we're involved in. And he asked, you know, Eddie, why, uh, you know, have you stopped doing the music thing? I think there's something there. And, you know, I, music's obviously been a big part of what I do. It kicked off my creative journey, as I mentioned earlier with that album. It's been sort of, um, you know, intertwined into this process. You know, I write a lot of background tunes. I'm, I, I wrote the background music you're listening to right now. I haven't completely left it, but I've pivoted. And... When he asked why it, it's been sort of in the background, I couldn't give a complete answer. I, I didn't really know. But as I began to think about it, the answer really rose to the surface. Right? I became uh, so fixated on, on one dimension of what I was doing that I started to look at it through a lens of scarcity and ignoring the infinite possibility out there. I mean, really, in relation to what's possible, my accomplishments are, are, are a grain of sand on the beach, right? It's very minimal, but that's not how you look at things when you really get lost in the weeds. I didn't want to hurt my credibility. I didn't want to lose what I built. I didn't want to sabotage a quote unquote winning formula. But guess what? That's not what life's about. That's not what my brand or message is about. That's not what got me here, right? Exploring creativity is what got me here. It means everything. And, and that was such an eye-opening thing, it was such a beautiful uh, reminder that, Ed, you're limiting yourself. You're not evolving fully. There's a treasure chest around the corner and you're too worried about losing your shiny penny. And it was from this predicament, right, being honest with myself, um, that that courage and that determination grew. You know, in fact, 
uh, the struggle ended up exponentially increasing my overall happiness because it re-emphasized the creative flexibility necessary to do what I think's right. The third ode to excellence is a promise to keep that flame lit. And see, these are just a handful of little stories, right? They're, they're little epiphanies. But I can say wholeheartedly that they shaped me. Not because every day of the journey I was constantly smiling, but it was the specific times that I wasn't that made me stronger. I'm happier now, my life is better now because of these situations. And that's what I wanna emphasize, right? Happy all the time isn't the goal, it can't be the goal. Living a life you're proud of and turning the bumps along the way, the inevitable roadblocks along the way into momentum, that's gonna give you long-term happiness. That's gonna make you feel better about every moment. It's such a gift to be here, we're so lucky. Let's move away from the idea that there are people out there that never have a bad day. Nothing's ever wrong in their life, because that's not only untrue, but it dilutes the opportunity in front of you. It makes you feel like you're losing when bad things happen, when in fact, those are the tools to win, to live every day to the fullest, right? The reality is sometimes it, it is the Hallmark card thing, right? Hands out, sun on your face, smiling, humming your favorite song, life is good. Sometimes it's picking up those little pieces when things feel like they're falling apart around you. But know that regardless, right, either one or anywhere in between, there is positive there. There is power at your feet. Just find it, hold it, and by all means, keep moving forward.